How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be talking pro wrestling for the next two hours. We're going to have Carl Elliott Stern, who is uh, uh, author of a couple of books on pro wrestling. In fact, he's got one book that's coming out like any minute now. I actually got an advanced copy of it yesterday, so we'll talk about it. It's the uh, actually the Ultimate Book of Pro Wrestling List, Volume 2. And he also did the Ultimate History of Pro Wrestling, which is kind of a chronological, in-order list of basically every big match, big occurrence in the history of wrestling going back to... Gosh, I think maybe the 17 or 1800s. Um, I mean, he did a great job on that. And we'll talk about history. We can talk about, well, we will talk a lot about the present and some of how it relates to history and some comments on uh, world titles and all that kind of good stuff. So anyway, we'll be he'll be up in about a half an hour. We're also going to have Eddie Goldman up in a couple minutes to update on Abu Dhabi, which is going on also right as we speak, three-day tournament in Abu Dhabi. It's a submission tournament. A couple of pro wrestlers are in it, uh, Kiyoshi Tamara. Yoshi Kasak is in it. Yoshi Akiyatsu's in it. Although uh, he was facing Rico Rodriguez in the first round, so got a feeling he may not. If that match is already taking place, he may not be in it anymore. But anyway, we'll have that. Uh, of course, uh, SmackDown was last night in Philadelphia. We got Brian here, of course. Um, I will. Uh, we got that. Uh, some content issues on WWF. Uh, so we got quite a bit of news actually to talk about. But we will start with SmackDown. Brian, how are you? I'm doing good. That's good. Uh, let me see. Let me go through. Okay. Let me, I'm going to go through SmackDown, and then we'll do the uh, Abu Dhabi. So let me go through SmackDown. Um, uh, let's see. Devin Storm, Chris Ford, uh, was there under the name Devin Storm. Of course, she was Crowbar in WCW in a dark match. He lost a prototype uh, who was brought in for the weekend. Did you uh, hear how they looked? Um, I heard Devin Storm. Um, people, like, knew who he was, so mm-hmm. that was kind of a positive. Uh, there are a lot of comments. We got a lot of comments uh, in the emails from from the show. Um, the basic the comments I got were that uh, except for the Jeff Hardy won the Intercontinental Title from Triple H, and basically and the, the comments were except for that it was not a very good show. A lot of people complaining about long delays and things like that. So uh, they had a full house though. Uh, let me see. Let's go to the SmackDown part of the show. Uh, the show opened with a long interview with uh, Triple H, Stephanie, and Steve Austin. And uh, they dare anyone to stop them. And Jeff Hardy comes in and uh, nails both uh, Austin and Triple H with a chair shot and knocks them down. And Stephanie slaps Jeff Hardy, and Jeff Hardy hits Stephanie with a twist of fate. So there is someone who um, they shot the rocket um, with Jeff Hardy. Um, and it's funny because that was not even a couple of days ago. Well, I mean, there was a plan. Don't get me wrong. Monday was planned to elevate the Hardys and Lita to, to a higher status. But the idea of Jeff Hardy being Intercontinental Champion, I don't think that that was so much of a plan even a few days ago. But the reaction in Boston to the the Hardys' match with Austin and and Triple H, uh, that the fans bought them in that role, which is largely a lot of it due to Triple H and Austin's uh, great job they did of selling, uh, made them think that uh, they got something here with the Hardys. um, And also that may uh, change around the, uh, the entire face of the card, although... As of at least last night, the Backlash pay-per-view, the main event, is still Undertaker and Kane against Helmsley and Austin. Of course, it can change since that hasn't even been announced publicly yet, but that, as of last night, was still the plan. Anyway. What do you think of Jeff's uh, promo on Monday? What? What do you think of Jeff's what? promo on Monday? When they were all talking in the locker room and Jeff said, mm, you know, it was it's like lying on the, he was lying on the couch and it, yeah. it, was, it wasn't bad or anything, no, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I was pretty impressed, actually. Yeah, it was all right. It's all right. Better than uh, the promo that he did for the um, Chef Boyardee commercial. Yes. You know, yeah. the whole thing is, it was kind of like what I was talking about for the SmackDown show. I mean, this whole time, I've always seen the Hardys as pretty much being bigger stars in the big show. That's why I thought the whole idea of well, the big show today, elevating the Hardys <laughs> was like, how does that work? Hey, you want to know what I heard about the big show? Um, Uh-oh. I was going like, okay, so, so there's going to be like a rebuilding of the big show since you beat him twice on Monday. It's like, no. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, w- I was reading through the because uh, I finished up the TV reports and everything last night, and I felt really bad for the Big Show because okay, he, he got beat on SmackDown, then he got beaten up, then he got beat twice more in a row in in like one hour, two matches. He did the job both matches in an hour on Raw. It was like at the end of the show, I thought this guy must have done something. He didn't lose weight. He must have missed his weigh-in or something. He didn't lose weight. How many? He's been told for months. And, and, you know, I mean... i got to say one more thing about Big Show, by the way, and I don't want this to come off as sounding bad, because the interview on the website that we've been talking about, it really is a good interview. And I think that, like, 95% is it, is of it, is it up he's being very is, honest, and, you know, it's good. But 
He had one comment about... Brian, his, Brian, real quick, is that interview up yet? I don't know if it's up, actually. I just got the copy. Okay. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't I, know why I haven't... It's going to be up today. Yeah, if it's not, it'll be up in the next day or two, because um, it's actually was written. I think it's going to be up today at some point. But anyway, go ahead. He made one comment. He's talking about his weight, and he goes, you know, i got to tell you guys this. I'm, I'm really not fat. My, my belly, my stomach is just very large because of the acromegaly. And yeah. it's really very hard, and I'm only fat, like, in my ass and the back of my legs, he said. And I thought... That's where he gets his fat. Yeah. I thought, said. you know, Big Show had acromegaly, and it got taken care of before he even got into wrestling. And I seem to yeah, remember him in WCW. He was like, it got taken care of when he was still in college. Yeah. And I seem to remember in WCW, his stomach was nowhere near as large as it is today. So well, to not blame a, his not, size on acromegaly... You know, not at, eight not years the, after the fact. Uh, okay, not at, I don't know. not at the end in WCW. Well, the, well, he was growing. I'm just saying at the beginning. If this all had to do with acromegaly, why didn't he have a huge stomach at the beginning in WCW? Right. Yeah, no, I, I remember that one time on WCW when he had gotten up to like a legitimate 500 pounds at one point, which is heavier than I think he ever was in WWF. Um, they did a flashback when he first broke in, and he was about 375 at that point. Um, yeah. And it was just amazing, like in four years or three years, whatever, I suppose like three years, how much weight he had gained. And, um, you know, when he, when he came in as the Andre son for that uh, first pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, he didn't, you're right, he didn't have a big belly then at all. Okay. But it's a good interview, so check it out. Yeah, it is. I don't want to uh, completely then, run down a big show because I kind of do feel bad for him today. Yeah. Then uh, Triple H demanded an Intercontinental title match with Jeff Hardy, and Regal agrees and ends up scolding Jeff Hardy for putting the twist of fate on Stephanie. Albert beat Spike Dudley. Um, after the match, uh, Dudley's came in, made the save, but the finish was Spike Dudley got put through a table by Albert, which will be Spike Dudley's uh, getting pounded too uh, for a while. Uh, let's see. Deborah asks uh, Dave Hebner where JR's locker room is. Okay, this actually is kind of funny. Anyway, they come back, and uh, so anyway, J uh, Steve Regal, William Regal, uh, yells at Jeff about putting his hands on women. And uh, then Big Show comes in and demands a match with Undertaker and Kane. And Regal says that he'll grant him his wish, but Big Show has to get a tag team to be his partners for a three-on-two handicap. So he's got to go and find himself a tag team. So, anyway. Uh, Lita Remember goes to that, by the way. Yes. Lita goes to interview Crash Holly, and Rhino beats him up. So, anyway, Deborah is in Jim Ross's office and uh, basically trying to apologize for what Steve did and just be like kind of the baby face. And then Steve Austin comes in and accuses JR of hitting on Deborah, and then kicks JR out of <laughs> Steve Austin's locker room, which was Jim Ross's locker room. I, I, maybe maybe this is, maybe actually this makes sense on TV. We'll see. Uh, China squashed Ivory. Stevie Richards then went to interfere. And she squashed him, too. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. The Big Show tried to recruit the APA. Uh, they said no, and they started making fun of him for being fat. So, anyway, that's uh -oh, the deal see? on him. Everyone he missed the way in. Yeah, every, everyone's going to make fun of him for being fat. Uh, then they did a four-on-two match. Edge, Christian, Angle, and Regal beat Benoit and Jericho when Angle pinned Jericho with an Olympic slam. Uh, then let me see. After the match... You know what's kind of interesting about that is I think they're actually already teasing that Jericho's going to turn heel on him because I guess they were doing like a segment to set the match up. And Jericho's the one that's kind of complaining about it. They have to do this handicap match. And Benoit's just like, come on, let's go do it. So... They're portraying him as the tough guy that doesn't care, and Jericho's the guy who's kind of whiny, so I assume they'll turn. Yeah, uh, let's see. So after the match, they knock Edge and Christian out of the ring, and uh, they put, um, let's see, one has the walls. Uh, Jericho, would put, I guess, put the, wall, the walls on Regal, and Ben will put the cross face on Angle. So that's, that's what happened there. Uh, let me see. Then uh, Hardcore Holly against Rhino with, was kind of a non-finish. Uh, Rhino gored uh, Bob Holly and the referee at the same time, so it was like a no ending. And then Molly came in with a trash can, and um, I think uh, Bob started using it. Uh, wanted to chase Rhino, but Molly stops him, and Bob and Molly start arguing. So I don't know what that's all about. Uh, let's see. Uh, Test and RTC. So anyway, RTC tried to recruit Test to join, so it's the same thing they did with Raven. Uh, of course, uh, he said no. Then Big Show uh, goes to his second choice for a tag team, Kai and Ty. Um, Good second have, choice uh, there. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Big Show, let's see what, Kai and Ty makes fun of Big Show, um, saying, you know, he's really fat. Uh, then 
<laughs> Big Show makes fun of them, oh, uh, saying that they're Chinese. So that's nice. And then oh, um, yeah, that's an insult. Yeah, that was an insult. And then uh, so they're comparing being Japanese to being fat. No, no, they're Chinese. Oh, I, oh, that's right. Okay. They're comparing being Chinese to being fat. And then um, they agreed to be his partner because he forgot to tell them who their opponents were. So then they come out and they find out it's Kane and the Undertaker, and they're not happy. And Big Show just walks out on them, and Undertaker and Kane like kill Kai and Ty. And I, when I say kill, I mean kill because Kane, the finish was supposed to be Kane doing the last ride on Show Panaki. And uh, he didn't do it good the first time and nearly killed him, uh, lost him somewhere. Anyway, at this point, uh, the crowd is chanting, uh, we want Lawler, but it's during commercial break. And I guess it was really loud because uh, everyone, I mean, I'd say just about every report I got mentioned how surprisingly loud that chant was, which is surprising in, in, in and of itself just because, um, you know, it's been several weeks now. You know, I mean, the first week, second week wouldn't surprise me. And um, it got worse because Taz got up and... Flipped the finger at the crowd when this wow. was going on. So he was very upset. Uh, Test beat Val Venus. Maybe Raven they wanted the... to keep Taz and replace Michael Cole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Test beat Val Venus. Raven interfered um, as a member of RTC. Um, and anyway, somehow or other, when this is all said and done, RTC either does their breakup or starts their breakup because uh, Bull Buchanan... And um, Val, I think Bull Buchanan and Valvina start fighting each other, and Goodfather starts beating up on on uh, Stevie Richards. So uh, maybe it's the end for them. And it didn't come soon enough. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Jeff Hardy beat Triple H when there was Triple H beat up the ref, uh, and then Matt Hardy ran in, hit Triple H with a chair shot, Swanton bomb. Jeff Hardy won, and uh, good match. And uh, good ending of the show. And uh, that was pretty much it for that. We'll get Eddie up here before we talk a little bit more about uh, some of the stuff in Japan. Uh, but, uh, let's, Eddie, what's going on in Abu Dhabi? Well, today they had the uh, first day of the competition, but it was just the Arabic regional competition. The uh, main tournament will start tomorrow. Uh, Abu Dhabi is about... Eight hours ahead of uh, New York time, so you can do the math wherever you happen to be on that. The competition will start at noon Abu Dhabi time, so that'll be about 4 a.m. Eastern time, and I guess about 1 a.m. Pacific time in the United States. And it was just the Arabic regional competition, and uh, we spoke earlier on, on my show, which of course is before yours, with uh, Kid Peligro and Miguel Iterati. Some interesting results that took place. One of the things they pointed out, they have the under 65 kilo weight class, was uh, won by a fellow named Tariq al Ketbi, who's only 15 years old and a really young guy. And so uh, he's somebody that they said is really amazing and look forward to in the future of, of hearing that name. Um, it's the same rules pretty much, although the matches are shorter. It's uh, submission wrestling, and you can also win by points if you don't get a submission in there. And I suggested it would be interesting to see, because they said, what level are these guys in the Arabic competition compared to the people that are in the main tournament? Because in the main tournament, you have a, a ton of Gracies. Hoyler Gracie is in there, a Henzo Gracie, and many, many others, and people that are well-known, you know, Jean-Jacques Machado, and many others that are known to be really the greatest grapplers in the world. And I made a suggestion that maybe what they should do is that the winner of that Arabic tournament in each weight class would advance the next day to be in the regular competition just to see how good some of these guys are. Um, in the lightweight class at 75 kilos, the winner was a guy named Marcos Escobar Saad, and he's a guy that's been training for many years in Brazil, as have some of the other competitors in there too. So even though all the people are in it are from the Arab country, some of these guys are a little bit more experienced and have trained, you know, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or with Huas Valley Tudo and uh, gives them a bit of an edge and experience in there. Now, was there a website uh, that you can, that will be updated for results? Because I may be up real late tonight. I may want to check out, like, because actually if it starts at 1 a.m., there actually may be some matches before I go to bed tonight. Yeah, the uh, Abu Dhabi Combat Club news page. The address is news.edcombat.com, and you can check that out. They're also using, uh, there'll be limited access on a webcam. They're experimenting it 
with it this year. You got to have a high speed connection, and they're only going to make it available to 200 viewers for three minutes at a time. So it's you know limited bandwidth they're setting up, but at least you be able to see something. And I think eventually they want to put the whole thing up on the internet, which is why they're kind of experimenting at that time. So that's news dot ad combat dot com, and uh, Miguel and the people there will be updating it uh, as they go. Okay. Good enough. And uh, tomorrow, I guess, we'll have uh, so, so pretty much most of the first round should be done in time for tomorrow's show, right? Yeah, they will be they will be doing the first three rounds of matches. Then there are, in each of the weight classes, there are eight matches in the first round of 16 competitors. So they'll do the first three rounds, just leaving the finals and the super fight for uh, Friday's competition. Oh, so basically the whole tournament. So, so we'll know the championship matches uh, tomorrow. Yeah, we should know them uh, at the end of tomorrow, which will be the beginning of uh, the day here. In so really, so really, uh, uh, later today, late late tonight is the uh, the big night with uh, most of the matches. Okay, that's cool. Very good. Okay. All right. Thanks, bunch, Eddie. Great. All right. Thanks. Well, take care. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Japan. What do matches held? Just like a regular ring? Um, they're held. It's just like a mat, isn't it, Eddie? I- I've seen the tapes. Yeah, it's it's on a mat like you used in martial arts tournaments. It's not a, not any ropes or yeah, it's not an elevated ring or or a cage or anything like that. Right. Okay. And, and it's in this stadium, and it's like uh, you know the whole story about Abu Dhabi, don't you, Brian, about the sheik and everything like that. Yeah. Not Ed yeah. Farhat. There's this like rich rich <laughs> an sheik, actual sheik. Is, an actual real wealthy sheik who brings in the greatest fighters in the world and. It's kind of uh, for him and his thousand friends. <laughs> yeah, they're starting to open it up, though. From what I understand, tickets are on sale to the public. And there's a, it's an interesting story because Kid Peligro, who writes in the Abu Dhabi page, knew the Sheik when he was in college. And they were also you know, studying jiu-jitsu together. And nobody knew this guy was a Sheik, meaning he's this, one of the sons of the Emir, which is the absolute monarch in Abu Dhabi. They just knew he was some guy from one of these Arab countries. Countries, and an Arab guy at school. An Arab guy at school. <laughs> they didn't know that you know that he was in with the petrodollars, and he was just a regular guy because he didn't want to make friendships based on the fact that he was a sheik. And you know, you mean he didn't like try to pick up on girls? Like, hey, I'm a sheik, and I've got a bil- billions of dollars. No, no, he didn't. I try mean, I give him credit for that. that one. He didn't try to do any of that. And so wow. later, when he finished college and he went back to his only Vince McMahon would be. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, he, he went back to his own country. And he invited uh, Kid Peligro there, and and people were saying, you know, this guy's the sheik, he's the son of the king, and all this. He's like, yeah, right, yeah, believe it. And then, of course, when he gets there, he finds that, oh, man, he really is. So it's it's quite an interesting story. It's, it defies a lot of the stereotypes that are out there. God, you know, um... When you really I mean, think about that, though, how is a sheik supposed to go to college, you know, <laughs> without being incognito? They wear, you know, is he going to wear, like, his robe and everything and sit in the back of the classroom? No, but people no, may no, know that. No, but I mean, I'm I'm just amazed that he didn't like flash his money around. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, what I mean? like, you know, he didn't have to say he doesn't have to say like I'm the sheik. I'm a sheik, but he could. You know what I mean? You know how like obnoxious rich kids are in school. Uh, tell yeah. me about it. But see, <laughs> when they were doing jujitsu, they would say to this, you know, the the younger guys or the newer guys, they're the ones that would clean up and say, "Hey, you over there, you you wash the mat, you clean the mat." And okay, and he did it. And they might, if they had known he was royalty, they might have been more hesitant to do so. And he, the point is, he didn't want to be treated differently from anybody else, which is quite a, a unique story. That's a great story. Yeah. That's even better than the little bit of the story that I knew. I just thought it was like some crazy sheep that... Uh, he deserves <laughs> credit for that. No, he does. He deserves tremendous credit. I had like a full throne built in the classroom for me to sit on. <laughs> <laughs> Elevated above everybody else. I, I read Dave's news li- newsletter on my throne, but I think you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the... Um, <laughs> No, no, that's, and, and he's done a lot for the martial arts world because this is, you know, I mean, when it comes to submission wrestling, I mean, this is this is the thing. And they invited people from all forms. I mean, like, uh, you know, Greco-Roman guys, professional wrestlers, um, shooto guys, rings guys, you know, guys from from everything and everywhere. Pancras, Genki Sudo, uh, and Sanai Kikido there from Pancras. Yeah, Pancras guys, guys were there. Pride, UFC A lot of guys. Pride guys, yeah. Um, um, some of the, a lot of guys that are in the upcoming UFC are, are in this one. Um, Joey Gilbert's in it, right? And um, yeah, Joey Matt, Matt Sarah's in it, right? Yeah, yeah. So and guys and, that have been um, there before, 
and guys that may be there in the future. And Mike Van Arsdale is there this Mike year. Mike Van Arsdale. And sure. Tom, Erickson, Tom Erickson, for the first time in ages, is passing up the uh, U.S. Freestyle Nationals, which were also this week. He's there. Uh, Roberto Travin, who, Jeff Monson, who had been in the UFC. Kosaka is there. I mean, it's just a real all-star lineup. Yeah, it's Hammer is going to be in there with guys his own weight for the first time in his life. Right, right. And you know, uh, they always have him go against these guys that are 50 pounds heavier than him. And he's, yeah, he's got Laborio just... in, the, in the Ricardo Laborio in the opening round. And Maeda is not going to be there ringside to uh, change the results if he doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to be there to deck him from behind either, huh? Exactly. Evan Tanner's just... in this. There will be no arrest of Akira Maeda this weekend. Uh, not in Abu Dhabi, but maybe somewhere else. You never know. Get, get, the week, the week is young. Yeah. Anyway, Eddie, all right. Um, okay. We're going to get to a couple of quick notes as far as uh, in the uh, GHC tournament, which was in Japan in Hiroshima today, uh, Mitsuharu Masawa pinned Jun Akiyama, so he'll go against the winner of tomorrow, tomorrow's Vader Yoshihiro Takiyama match, which will take place on Easter Sunday in Tokyo. So uh, it looks like a Masawa Vader final, which actually makes the most sense because they got. The Ariaki Coliseum to fill, and uh, Miss Al. They need. I think Miss Al and Vader is the match for the Ariaki Coliseum. So, they did a double count out, and then they restarted the match, and then Miss Al got the pin with it, like an inside cradle or a small package, like 90 seconds later, which sounds so American. And whenever they do American, <laughs> I don't yeah, know that why they sure got over in the uh, Shawn Michaels Bret Hart match. Uh, it wasn't a DQ. Yeah, at least it wasn't Even a DQ. The restart, everyone was like, "Man, they did, did they do a restart and they go a minute." What's the point? Yeah, well, that's what they did here. They went 90 seconds. Well, and that yeah. was the same as I think. It, in fact, when I read the result when I woke up this morning, that was the exact thing I thought. Is like, I saw that with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. It's like you go 60 minutes with no falls, and then you do a pin in a minute. You know, it's yeah. like, eh. anyway. And then in the Champion Carnival, Tenru beat Taiokia, which is no surprise, uh, with a lariat in 17 minutes. Um, so he he won the tournament and the Triple Crown. Uh, so he must be the booker. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, we still don't have, unless uh, they're on the machine right now. That's kind of an interesting now. finish, though, because if that was like a semifinal match, that would mean that if it had been, what was it, double count out? Yeah, it was double count out. Okay, so that means Vader would have just, you know, taken the title, right? No, so they have, but they, they have, it, it was a must have Oh, yes, they, yeah, they haven't won final matches, right, okay. But the thing is, okay, with NOAA, which is an offshoot of all Japan, I see this is what's bad about it, is, it, and this is why it was so stupid to do a double count out. I would think probably you got to go back... As far as all Japan, I mean, there's probably, someone will probably find something in like 92 that I've forgotten, but the last count out that I remember was Abdul the Butcher and Tiger Jeet Singh in 1992, wasn't it? No, it was 1990. I was at the match. Oh, okay. It was, it, it was on June 8th, 1990. Um, they did a double count out, and I mean, they were brawling like in the stands, like way, they end up in the upper deck of Budokan, which is a huge building, <laughs> and it's pretty hard to get back down in, in a 20 count, but I mean, the fans booed that finish so bad. I mean, and, and that was like they had just started probably about a few months earlier, you know, doing the thing where there's going to be pins and there's, they're not going to do juice. And, you know, they basically when Baba changed the thing because of the popularity of UWF, where they changed the whole way they did their pro wrestling and did clean finishes in every match. And they felt that, you know, because, you know, they always let Butcher still do the blade because, you know, without the blade, you know, you can't really be Butcher. And they figured that Butcher and Jeet Singh could still do the double count because that's what they always did historically, right? You know, and they're old timers and they're not figured into the main mix anyway. So they did their double count and the crowd was so mad because it was sort of like, and I don't, I don't think they ever did one again. Now, New Japan did it and it never worked every time they did it. And I'm just shocked that by, you know, like they would fight outside the ring in, in all Japan for all those years and the referee just wouldn't count. And it was just understood that you don't do count outs and you just, the referee would just tell them to get back in the ring, they'd get back in the ring. And to do a double count out means they had to have counted. And that just, even though they came up and did a finish at the end, it's like they've just told people that we're going to do count outs again. And it's like, why even tell people that? Because nobody wants it. Yeah. Anyway. So Watching too much Raw. Um, I don't know if they got that one from Raw. But it is, it is totally Americanized. I mean, New Japan, those guys are watching too much Raw. I think that's pretty clear. A bunch of other news. Uh, Rob Black did not win the uh, mayor mayoral race last night in Los Angeles. In fact, um, in, uh, he didn't even know in the, what uh, the capital was. I actually I thought that was hilarious when they asked him what the capital of Los Angeles was and he said Sacramento. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> the capital of Los Angeles. There is no capital of Los Angeles. Oh, oh okay. I, I, he, he did some interviews. They were they were hilarious. Um, but he got I think it was 739 votes, 
Wow. <laughs> Probably more than he should have. That's like but, that's uh, like every fan that attended one of those shows. Yeah, but that's scary. I mean, just because you attended. Impressive. Yeah. Well, well Vince got every single person that watched Raw. I get twenty million. Cast his vote that one night. Oh, and maybe <laughs> no. Through the whole election. Yeah. XFL ended up doing a 1.5 both March 31st and April 7th, so those would be the two lowest uh, rated primetime shows in the history of the Big Four networks. Um, in fact, he would end up with uh, I think he I think that with the season over, I think he probably end up with like six of the lowest eight shows ever. Uh, somehow <laughs> someone's next still... year though to try and break that record. Well, I ain't gonna be back in primetime on NBC. I know that. Oh, you know what's funny is um in the Newark Star Legend. Okay, well, wait, hold on. Let's add all these up because you know they were promising what a nine five. You no, know, they were promising uh between ten five and eleven for the cum for the three. Okay, let's so say ten did, five. Okay, so they did a one. They did a one five on um NBC and they did an 06 on uh, UPN and we don't have the TNN number, but uh, you know it's probably like a 04. Oh wait, national because it'd be national, so it's eh, they probably still ended up with an 04. So that's two six. So they ended up at one five two one two five. Wow, that's yeah. horrible. Oh yeah, that's horrible. Um, somehow, somehow, it's going to be justified, but I don't. God knows how. <laughs> we tried the holiday thing yesterday. That didn't work. Mm, yeah, there's always a holiday. Uh, somebody, somebody on the Sunday one said that there was something on. On one of the other networks, there was always something. On the other Wasn't that the ping pong championships? The email we no, got yesterday. No, that was a joke. That was a joke. It was um, one though. Okay. <laughs> there was uh, um, yeah, they say that they'll be back next year. You know what was funny is like the Newark Star Ledger. Um, they had a story and they were quoting Basil Devito and Mike Keller. You know, saying you know Mike Keller said um, you know I'm I, you know uh, I don't even want to bring up that quote you know of, of but I'm bringing it up right. Come on, say it. Okay, he swore on the heads of his children that they would be back last year. And, of course, you know what that brought up in my mind. So that's a How can that Earl even be a coincidence? The old Earl Hebner. So, anyway, um, but then they were saying about how TNN and UPN, <laughs> you, know, you know the UPN story. Anyway, TNN and UPN, <laughs> even though NBC wasn't happy with the ratings, the TNN and UPN were happy. Okay, and TNN's numbers for Sunday afternoon, I think the XFL numbers were probably higher than TNN was doing with whatever they had in that time slot. You know, I think they... Maybe not though, because um, TNN's you know, but but it probably is a little bit higher. Certainly, like the first week when they did the, the uh, two four is higher. You know, I mean, the last couple of weeks maybe it's about the well, same what, as they were what doing. What did we say their average was? Like a point nine for the season? Or no, or for, just the for average for TNN programming. Um, for twenty four hours a day, I, I don't know what the Sunday afternoon average is. The prime time average is a one one, so they're nowhere okay. close. But but they're but the show's not in prime time. The show's in Sunday afternoon. Okay, we got Carl Stern on the line. We'll get to him in just. Okay, um, now I know that when. Um, let me see. I have seen TNN things on 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 uh, Saturday afternoons. You know, like what they do, and it's usually about an 03 to an 04. So they are slightly above. So they're probably slightly above what they were doing in those time slots. Now UPN. I mean, the thing that they're the the, the one with UPN is a, is a riot because they go. You know, we're ahead of. You know what UPN was doing in these time slots last year, and it's like UPN didn't run Sundays last year. Well, they're telling the truth then. No, no, but those affiliates, those affiliates. You tell me, those affiliates weren't getting those sixes locally. I mean, I mean, I guess some of them probably, some of them probably weren't, but I would think most of them were. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, that's how can they even think of continuing a league just so they can air a show on TNN that's going to get a point five. Well, they, Vince McMahon has said that without a network broadcast partner, they wouldn't continue the league. So if UPN drops it, um, you know, and UPN has the right to drop it because they only had a one-year contract. Now, TNN hey, has Even if contract. UPN doesn't drop it, and they're getting a point five on TNN and a point whatever on UPN, where's yeah. all this money going to come from to keep this thing alive? Um, that is a mystery. That's the mystery of economics, which actually... Sold out stadiums? Well, that's not going to happen either, because the attendance, you know, the attendance dropped every week. I mean, they were, you know, I mean, one of the things that they're, you know, claiming was like they averaged 23,000. But, you know, that's like, you know, that's using those fake numbers to get that number. Yeah. You know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm just like, you know, it's like we had, you know, 939,000 attendance for the season. But it's like, 
Yeah, but I mean, it was like, you know, I mean, there were newspaper reports of these games where the attendance is listed as 25,000. The newspapers say there's 7,000 people there, and we know they're papering like crazy in all these cities. So, so it's like, those, those numbers don't mean anything, you know? Yeah. It's funny how the rating was so bad that that didn't even have a chance to become a scandal. All this paper. Well, no one even knew about it because, no, you know, quite frankly, no one cared. Once the media, once they saw the rating, you know, it was like, you know, why that even look any story? Further? Yeah, why look any further? They promised, an, they were promising an 11. They ended up the last week at a 2.5. You know, who cares what they did? Up? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's basically that. Um, the WWF. Well, they have to do make good too on all those ads. They, they, okay, here's the deal, um, and I don't know which one, I don't know like the, the, the contracts with every different person, but I did hear about Anheuser-Busch. This is scary. It's not make goods. They have to give the money back based on the percentage wow. of what they didn't deliver. So, like, they collected, God, what was the number? 45, so just, what? No, I'm just thinking how much money this league's going to lose. Thinking about, okay. just if we know one company, what about everything, everybody else? Well, which okay, I, I, that's remember, remember remember I did that thing where where I figured out that the whole league was going to lose about ninety million. Now that was based, Brian, on maintaining a four point six QM average for the rest of the year. And I mean, and obviously this last week was two point six. They never after that week they did that. They never came close to a four point six again because they were four point one the next week. So so based on so th this league, you know, they're talking about forty million in losses. I mean, they're doing that not figuring in all the money they got to give back to these to these uh, companies for advertising. So those losses, that's, that's, you know, that's, you know, this, this is losing far more money than uh, WCW, which is kind of funny because, you know, like people in, in, in WWF, and, and rightly so in many ways, you know, make fun of how absolutely horribly managed and how you could lose so much money. And here they are. They got their own company that's actually losing more money and obviously they doing a hell of a lot worse. Work. What? They lose double. Uh, it's not going to lose double what WCW lost. But it's going to lose more than uh, not double. If you predicted ninety million for a ninety-two million, one, okay. But the thing five. is, is the WWF. Okay, but the thing is, WWF shares the losses fifty-fifty with NBC this season. Yeah. But the total losses, yeah, the total losses are going to be very big. Um, I may have to go sit down and redo that math and figure out where they where the losses really are going to come in. I, I'll wait till after the playoffs because they still got two more weeks. This playoffs may turn it around for NBC. Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, let me see. One more thing. Uh, speaking of WWF television, actually, we sort of weren't. Um, the uh, Canadian Broadcast Standards Council came down with a ruling yesterday on numerous complaints. You know what? I, I, I want to say this. You know, every time, every Tuesday, when TSN edits uh, Raw, we get, and we get tons of negative letters about TSN emails. And TSN gets flooded with phone calls and emails about editing, like just they did Monday night with Lita and uh, Steve Austin with the chair shots and everything. But you know what? I feel absolutely, I feel so sorry for TSN because TSN is like, they're like caught in the middle because they just got sanctioned for not editing certain things, okay, <laughs> Ye yesterday. And um, there was a quote from David Rosenblum, and, you know, you feel sorry for the big show. This quote, he's one of their spokesmen, he goes, we have to be mindful and responsible to the viewers. Those who feel the sh program should be edited more, and a lot more who feel it should be edited less. It's like, what are you going to do? There's, there's yeah. no win. So anyway, they think about, you were just talking about all the emails we get to this show. And think about the percentage of fans that watch TSN that are listening to this show. And then just try to imagine how many emails TSN must get. They're getting flooded every Tuesday when they edit something. But when they don't edit, you know, they're, you know, and now that when they don't edit something, they're, you know, they're getting sanctioned too. I mean, they, they, you cannot broadcast this raw and win. <laughs> Except for TNN, because nobody cares, I guess, in this country. <laughs> but anyway, they, um, they, they were, uh, they made some rulings regarding certain things, uh, over the last couple of years that they received n numerous complaints about. So anyway, one of them was the May Young giving birth to a hand. And they ruled that, uh, they ruled that, quote, the, the fact that the segment is absurd does not render it exploitive. So anyway, what they basically said was it was too silly to be taken seriously, and that was fine, and there was nothing wrong with that segment, except that it was, it was bad television, but you, you're allowed to do that. So, but anyway, where they did come down on were references to female... There's, okay, there's a Canadian Association of Broadcasters Sex Role Portrayal Code and Violence Code, and uh, Raw has violated that code, um, and here are the ways. And this is basically a code. So anyway, um, the references to female characters as wearing a $2 walking suit. Now, do you remember that one? $2 walk. Who said that? I 
Probably Jericho, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember a $2 walking suit. The horny little she, the horny little she devil, of course, that's Jim Ross. And a filthy, disgusting, filthy, dirty, disgusting, Jim Ross. brutal. Isn't oh, yeah, horny little she devil? Um, yeah, Lawler. I bet Terry. Lawler, too? No, both of them. Ross has said I can't horny. remember Jim Ross ever saying that. Okay. Um, so anyway, maybe like he say. Anyway. Okay. Well, anyway, it's, clearly it was said because I it was, all, it was you know. And the other one was the filthy, dirty, disgusting, brutal, skanky, bottom feeding, trash bag hoe, which was actually a catchphrase. So anyway, um, they so TSN uh, has fa- has failed to provide adequate on air advi- viewer advisories during war regarding the content of the show, and they are now obliged to air a primetime statement that the channel has violated the sex role portrayal code. So anyway, that's what's going on there. Uh, with that, what does that mean? Gotta, uh, they got to apologize on, on in prime time in the next couple of days for for doing this, and they can't do it again. Okay. So that means they have to they have to watch the sexist remarks made on these shows. So there's going to be more editing of those shows, and we're going to be getting more emails. And uh, that's that. Anyway, we've got Carl Elliott Stern here. Carl, how you doing today? Hey Hello? guys. Hey, how you doing? How you guys doing? We're doing really good. Um, I want to mention that I, I got your uh, I got your book yesterday, or the I guess the rough draft of it. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. What now? What's why don't you tell everyone about the book and when it's coming out? Uh, the book will be available April twenty seventh. Right now, it's still at the uh, publishers. They're putting the covers on them and so forth. But it'll be out April twenty seventh. We are taking orders right now on the website and by mail or just however you can get it to us uh, for the uh, new. It's the updated version of a book we did. Two years ago, and uh, it's about twice as much material as in the one before. And we've added tag team uh, rankings and listings, and just a lot of oddball trivia stuff that any kind of uh, history buff of wrestling, I guess, would like. And even modern day fans, uh, folks, uh, I mean, it's up to date. It's uh, WWF and all the way up to the pre WWF WCW. I guess everything's in there, uh, updated and. And ready to go. You know, Dave, since uh, I was on the show last time in October, I've actually finally bought a computer where I can hear the show without it uh, buffering and, and being so horrible you can't understand it. And you guys do a really good job. I mean, you and Brian have great, great chemistry. Uh, I've, I've actually laughed and my side was hurting the last few days, some of the stuff you've come up with. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks. Really, really good. Uh, I was also wondering, I heard you talking about the XFL earlier. Uh, I'm of the understanding that they're going to change the XFL name. Have you heard that? Uh, I have not heard that at all. Well, uh, well uh, they're going to keep the letters, but it's going to, they're going to change it to 10 fans left. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, Which is about, I guess, how many are watching it on NBC now. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess. You know, one thing, since the last time you were on the show... Uh, wrestling's totally changed. <laughs> oh, no every single day. Now, what historically do you think the last couple of months, say since the beginning of this year, has been the most important in the history of wrestling? Certainly, in the modern era. I mean, there's uh, I can't think of anything post 1950 that would come close to touching it. I mean, maybe uh, the invention of television. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, post invention of television, I don't think there's anything at all. Uh, even when the NWA was fragmenting off in, in so many different directions, I don't think it even remotely. Well, wrestling's so much bigger now. I mean, as uh, we hear all kinds of numbers thrown out there, and I'm, I'm sure you know what the real numbers are. But I mean, wrestling as a whole on the U.S. scene is so huge that how could anything come close to touching it? I mean, uh, the money involved. Certainly, back in the you know 60s, 50s, wrestling was drawing as big a crowds and bigger as, than they are now. But there was no way was the marketing infrastructure and things like that as, as massive as it is now. Everywhere you go, something uh, wrestling's out there. You walk down the toy aisle of the of the Walmart, and you know wrestling stuff's all over it. You got wrestlers on snow. everything. Yeah. So, and, and there's never been anything like like that up to this point so the the money is just so huge so obviously uh, a basically a monopoly uh now in the u.s gosh i mean how can you get any big bigger than that 
Now, has there ever been, because I'm of the opinion that there has never been anyone who's had anywhere close to this kind of a market share of wrestling, you know, at any time than there's, that there's been wrestling, at least in this country. Ricky Dozan probably did have that in, in Japan at one point, but in this country, never, anything like this. Uh, you know, the heyday of Hulk Hogan, uh, late 80s. Uh, yeah, but there was tons of competition 80s. then. Oh, oh yeah, and but even then, you think about now. There's so much more wrestling merchandise out there. I mean, and the, there's just nothing that can touch it. I I don't know if you have the numbers that would compare uh, total business incomes or something like that from say WWF in '88 to uh, like now. I, I'm sure it's. That's uh, I would different. say '88. They were maybe. Let me see. Let me try to think of the what I would be told for various years. Um, I would think 88 was still pretty strong. Maybe 150 million. This year it's going to be 430. Oh gosh, see, so, you know. So there you go. Over three times the the difference. That's uh, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, is there anything new on the uh, WCW time slot today? I haven't. I've been kind of in out of contact. Uh, it's, the tentative plan is June 9th, 11, 11 okay. p.m. to 1 a.m. on TNN. Still basically the same thing, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any word on late contracts or anything? Like, I know, I, I mm. guess the WCW guys still don't even know anything. Uh, no, so I mean, I, I, checked, I, I checked last night after SmackDown. and I mean, the thing is, WWF is kind of, um, they're they're kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, it's it's bad for them because until they're Time Warner. They're too because Time Warner's not offering the buyouts yet. Yeah, until Time Warner starts negotiating buyouts with these guys, and I haven't talked to anyone. I mean, there's a whole list of guys, but two days ago I talked to one guy who knew everyone, and and, and we were discussing, like, his moves and stuff. And, I mean, he certainly hadn't heard, and he knew that, you know, Goldberg and Page and all those guys had not heard, because they all basically have the same attorney now, John Taylor. And he had not heard anything from Time Warner about any negotiated buyouts, so until they start negotiating buyouts and guys accept buyouts, WF can't even negotiate with these guys. So is, it's like, is it's, like it's really hold, tough. Yeah, is the merger holding anything up, or is this just a uh, red tape, drag your feet kind of thing? i got to imagine some of these guys are sweating. I mean, if I was working for WCW making, you know, the unbelievable money some of those guys do, and I had no idea if I had a job, I'd, you know, I'd be getting somebody on the case. Um, I think guys are going to be terminated. Have already been told, like some of the lower card guys. Uh, if they have a cycle, not it, but Brian, people. there's there's like there's all those guys that are on the bubble that nobody knows. Yeah, I mean, I, I there's guys that I know of that you know, I mean, they could be terminated. So you tomorrow. either know if you're being terminated or you'd still be getting a paycheck. No, they're still getting a paycheck now, but yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but they may not be for you know, like for, you know, they may not be eight weeks from now. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know. I mean, there's a lot of guys like that. I mean, I'll just throw Jarrett, Jarrett's name out. Well, actually, Jarrett's got, Jarrett may have a no cut. But, um, you know, the guys that have, you know, cuts that haven't been picked up, the Rey Mysterio, for example. I mean, you know, he hasn't, you know, he, he hasn't been signed by WWF. He's got a contract with WCW. It's got 90-day cycles. He hasn't been told they're cutting his contract. He just doesn't know. Yeah. I want to go to uh, Alex in Puerto Rico since he's calling on a payphone. Alex, what's going on? Hello? Hey, Alex. What's going on? Oh. Yo, Alex, you're on. Is Brian Alvarez there? Yeah, Brian Alvarez is there. Um, I subscribed to your newsletter. Okay. I still haven't gotten my free booklets yet. Okay. Yeah, we ran out a couple of weeks ago. Just uh, get your address to me, and I'll send them out to you. Um, Alexander Arce. Uh, actually, I don't think you should <laughs> give, give it on the air. Can you, uh, you have a computer with email? No. You don't? Okay, just um, send it via postal mail, and I'll get you it to you. You got my home address, right? Yeah, what's your, uh, just give me your first uh, name. You probably don't have a lot of Alex's Alex in Puerto Rico on your list. Alex in Puerto Rico? Hello? Okay, I'll get it out to you, buddy. Alexander RC. <laughs> okay. All right, give it to me, buddy. Okay, um, you going to mail it out? Yeah. Yes, you will. You have my address, right? I got it. Bye. Okay, I'd like to ask you something. Is ECW going to come back like the NWA did? No. They just filed bankruptcy. They're dead. W- when they died... Uh, like, well, I guess officially uh, they, died when, they officially died Wednesday, but they really died in January. After Guilty is charged, right? Uh, yeah, a week later. I would like that to would know. That would have been the last show. WCW Somewhere Worldwide, in, uh, is that still on syndication? WCW Worldwide? It may be, but it's only, if it is, it'll only be like for another week or so. Excuse me? 
If it is, it'll only be for another week or so. I'm not sure when the last episode is. I think they may have done the last episode already. I was wondering, um, what day is the new Nitro coming on TNN? Uh, Saturday night, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Starting June, June the 9th. When? Tentatively June the 9th. It could be June 16th. Um, May, June 16th? It could, June 9th right now could be June 16th. Because my cable company, Centennial Cable, does not carry TNN. Uh-oh. I'd love to give them a call. A bunch of cheap asses. <laughs> yeah, you should you should give you should give them a call and say I want. A lot of cable inside. companies are like that. That's yeah. why I, I, well, not going that's why I would switch to a dish. So, it's like you watch those annoying commercials that say you switch to a dish now you'll never get another girlfriend. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> right. Yes. Um, there was this show in Hot Tijos on WrestleMania weekend, mm-hmm. put on by the Iman Latin Wrestling Show Group, in here in Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. They got some good stars. Mm-hmm. How was uh, how was the shows? Uh, did you go? Did you do any of the uh, IWA shows over the weekend? Um, no, I, I've seen it on Channel Twelve. Miguel Perez dressed up as a fa- um, mummy. Right. He came out and started attacking Star Corporation. Yeah. And, I heard it was um, hot. Rick, and Shane the Glove Boy won the belt again in Bayamon. I heard that was an awesome match too. Yeah, so a friend of mine told me, and he heard from the internet that um. Grand Apollo and Ricky Banderas are turning heel against Shane the Glamour Boy. Yeah, Grand Apollo looks like he's going heel, yeah. I would like to know, um, since um, WWF bought WCW, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, will they start sending their stars to Puerto Rico, the WCW workers? Uh, to IWA? I guess they could. I mean, it certainly is not in the plans right now. The only guy I heard that's being sent to Puerto Rico regularly is uh, Russ McCullough's going starting, starting Friday, who's an OVW guy. What you say? Um, Ru- Russ McCullough. Russ, see who? Russ. He's McCullough. from Ohio Valley Wrestling. He's not on WWF TV yet. He oh. looks like Kevin Nash. Unfortunately. Damien so he got a haircut. Looks like Kevin Nash. What? Yeah, he looks like Kevin Nash. Russ McCullough. I heard yeah. that he's going to be given the junior heavyweight belt again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. So is Ray Gonzalez going to the new WCW? I seriously doubt it. Seriously. Why you say that? Yeah. He's eight times university champion here in the WWC. I heard twelve times, but it doesn't really matter. But who counted? <laughs> um, I've never seen I've never seen Ray Gonzalez, you know, years ago in Japan. He was pretty good. Don't you have a, um excuse me? I don't get tapes from Puerto Rico. I haven't seen a Puerto Rico tape in, in years, unfortunately. Well, um I enjoy Brian's newsletter so much. That so I thought oh, my friends. Uh huh. And my friends couldn't believe that ECW died. And most yeah. of my friends couldn't believe WCW uh, went out of business. Okay, yeah, it's a sad, sad day in wrestling. It's been yeah. a sad year. It's been a sad year in wrestling. Anyway, we got to go. Okay. Can I can I see something? Go ahead. Um, can you send me a um a sample issue of the Wrestling Observer? Uh, yeah, Brian, email me his address. He doesn't. Will do. And I'll, I'll I'll send him an issue. Okay. We'll take care, uh, Alex. Okay. Hey, Dave. Yes. Uh, just as happened to have right here in front of me out of the ultimate pro wrestling book of list actually a world wrestling council uh chapter i've added it to the book and i have ray gonzalez down as seven times if anybody cares with the dates and uh on the, uh, he, just, he just he just won it um, yeah, right, from that, bronco a week ago or so right that would make his eighth time there and based on all of his previous wins of course you know who's the number one guy on the held it the most uh, list? Oh yeah, Carlos. Carlos obviously. Yeah, by th- uh, three thousand eight hundred sixty days is what I have. Ray Gonzalez is number two, uh, seven fifty three is what I have for him day wise. Do you That's have any idea? How many titles or how many times has uh, Carlos won it? I have Carlos Colon down, and this is just. What I could verify, and I, I believe this is going to be pretty much 100% there. I have him down for 17 times. Now, he's uh, done. Lawler. Some... Lawler's got him with that USWA. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got, uh... Lawler's got four. Yeah, I've actually got a chapter in the book on <laughs> it, too. Lawler is uh, 20 something, uh, seems like, right offhand. Yes, right. That was including the southern, yeah. all those southern title reigns no. going back to the 70s. No. No, actually, that is just the unified title, 27 times. Oh, no, no, no. I know, including the Southern, yeah. it's got to be close to 100. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah, at least uh, at least that. Uh, take a guess on, uh, talking about the WC, WWC Universal title, Cologne yes. was number one, Gonzalez number two. Who do you think would be number three? Have you any idea? I bet it will surprise you. 
Uh, yeah, oh, that is really tough. Um, think about some of the uh, guys that were around in the 80s, and, uh, you know, you might think about uh, Hercules. God, everybody had, a lot of guys had short reigns. I don't remember too many guys with long reigns. I mean, Carly Clone. Uh, Carly Clone is number four. Oh, so I'm missing a guy. Yeah. Uh, God. It's not Butcher? Uh, uh, no, no, Butcher is 11th. Okay, who's number four? Number four is or uh, number four was Cologne, Carly Cologne. Number three is Greg Valentine. Uh, Greg Valentine was in there huh. 259 days. Well, I'm I'm glad we didn't wait until I picked him. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be uh, waiting a long time. And that's where, where's, where's, where's where's uh, where's Ronnie Garvin? Uh, Ronnie Garvin is and I just flipped off the list. Ronnie Garvin is number seven. Okay. Of the top ten are Carlos Cologne, uh, Ray Gonzalez, Greg Valentine. Carly Cologne, Hercules Ayala, Steve Strong at six, and then Ron Garvin, Dory Funk Jr. at eight, uh, Invader one at nine, and ten is El Nene. I should have picked Ayala, just because when I used to watch Puerto Rican wrestling, he was always Carlos's rival. Right. But anyway. And from to- more totally useless trivia like that, you can order the new Ultimate Pro Wrestling book a list. <laughs> And uh, the best way to get it, by the way, to get to my website, the easiest way is to go to kfabemagazine.com. I have an article up on this show appearance, as a matter of fact. If you'll just click on that article, it'll take you right to where you order the book. That's the quickest way to get there, kfabemagazine.com. Is there anything about the Wrestling Gold videos, too? Yes, the wrestling. There is an article up about the Wrestling Gold video. You know, I had no idea that was coming out. Uh, the yeah, April 24th. Yeah, I and I was reading the yesterday. Ma- yeah, I was reading the match uh, listings on Cafe Magazine, and there, that's a, that looks like a pretty good set. Is uh, there going to be a VHS version available too, or is it just DVD? Uh, yeah, VHS version and uh, DVD. And, I know um, the, I, Yeah, the article at Cafe sort of read like there would be one, but it wasn't real clear. Yeah, the um, I know the DVD has me and Jim Cornette doing the announcing, which is actually, I mean, I get some of it is really really funny. I was. Oh, I can't, I can't wait to hear that. That's going. And the, I, I was noticing something about the DVD version that is really neat. You can choose between you and Cornette or the original commentary. Or the original commentary. Wow, that's, that's pretty sharp. Uh, yeah, how did you and Cornette do that? Did you do it like you were watching the match for the first time? Um, I mean, you know, what's funny is, is like a lot of those matches. You know, Cornette is Cornette is at ringside at some of the really old ones doing photography, and then a <laughs> lot of. Uh, but but you know, most. I mean, I would say that. Eighty percent of the matches we'd both seen before, so we we didn't do it like it was. We didn't act like it was live. It, we acted like we're going back twenty years and this is what was going on. Cornette, you know Cornette's knowledge of that nineteen eighties wrestling. You know, I mean, when we talked, Brian, yeah. you and I talked about this anyway. There's nobody else in the world. I mean, and I mean in the world who could have done as good a job as Cornette. In fact, looking back on that uh, two day period that I spent doing those videos, if it was anyone but because because Brian actually at one point, in fact, it wasn't Cornette. It probably would have been Brian that would have done it with me. Oh, and, boy. It, and boy, it would have been. I'll tell you, it would have been a struggle. It'd been a hell of a disaster. <laughs> I think we'd. Have, I think we'd have been. Yeah. It'd have been you know, uh, twelve hours of commentary. Oh, God, I mean, it's, you know how hard it is to come up with new stuff. Twelve, but anyway, there's no one I think in this world that I could have done it with, except for Jim Cornette, where it would have turned out that good. Because his, no, I mean, his, no, he was just coming up with all these stories. And you know, I know enough stories, but you know, he knows so many more stories about that time period and. You know, living through that, and I mean, it was you know those Indianapolis stories and and uh, you know Memphis stories, and it's you'll, you'll really be entertained by Cornette. I, I I pretty much recommend it, and a lot of it's very funny too. Anyway, got that plug out of the way. Carl, you know, talk to Al because maybe we should, we would be able to sell the book through the web this website here, the Yada website. Well, that'd be great, and I'd I'd, I'd be glad to uh, do something with the DVD too if it, uh, that would work out as being something possible. Uh, but I, I greatly appreciate that. I'd like to. Did you watch AAA last night by any chance? No, I haven't watched it yet, but I have it coming. I didn't watch. Um, you haven't seen Pride yet, have you? No. Okay. Um, would I, you see Charlie Manson's fall. That would be on AAA Extreme, so I so that would that doesn't air in the states yet. Okay. Although although they they're doing the time slot for it. The. Um, I mean, the only thing I watched last night was an EML on Minis match, and it was like, it was incredible. <laughs> and, you know, most, e- I mean, not EMLL, AAA. The and, you know, most AAA yeah. stuff is so bad. And then I'm just like, I didn't watch any EMLL, and I just tuned in while I had a break last night. 
And they had this minis match. I'm going like, oh my god, you know. And it was. Did they have like the full size guys come out later? Um, in the show? Yeah, probably. Yeah. And they, you know, they probably weren't. They were. But I decided like, after uh, watching Triple A two weeks ago that if I ever have a mini counterpart, he better suck. <laughs> mini, mini Chico? Yeah, he better be horrible. I was watching his show and there's like mini Octagon Cito and then like the big Octagon comes out and just looks hideous. And oh, oh, Octagon! It was Octagon Cito, Mascarita Sagrada, and I'm sure these aren't originals because Mascarita Sagrada 2000, which should be 2001 now. But and then La Parquita, and these guys are just incredible. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, I mean, like the big Parka at least is funny. But yeah, like the big Octagon, who's not even that big. I mean, God, you know, that mini is like a thousand times better than he is. Yes, he is. Uh, I'm going to go through the poll real quick. We didn't get a chance to do this. What do you think of Monday Night Raw? 8% said excellent. 20% said good. 31% said average. 25% said bad. And 17% said awful. Not a good rating. Uh, we have a poll. What is the greatest pay-per-view of all time? And uh, don't send letters. We only had five choices. And I came up with about 15 of them. And I just had to whittle down. And anyway, they're uh, AA when worlds collide. Triple A when worlds collide. Since that's the well, one that seemingly more people mention than any other as the best pay-per-view ever. So I figured I had to put that in. Then I took two WCWs and two WWFs. The two WCWs B would be the 1989 Great American Bash and the 1996 Great American Bash. Uh, for the two WF ones, I picked two WrestleManias, which are 94's WrestleMania, which was with the you know WrestleMania 10 from the Garden, and the WrestleMania we just had uh, last week. So those are the five up there. There, are, I mean, I know there's WF Backlash, WF Calgary Stampede, um, you know, so many other. The EMLL show from last year, although a lot of people probably didn't see it, but that show was awesome. By the way, I heard that the EMLL pay per view from uh, last week. I heard that it was the second best pay per view they did, except except for the very first one. Sure. So I'm really looking forward to the tape for that. Ah, uh, let's see. We have so many emails to get to. Carl, just jump in when we sure. go through this. Sure. Uh, Let's see that trivia you were starting with. Oh, yeah, start with the trivia. Okay. Uh, hey, remind me also, I've got a list I made up especially for this show uh, before we get out. I don't want to give it out just yet, but it's, <laughs> I made up uh-huh. one of the five greatest issues ever of Wrestling Observer Newsletter. So don't let me forget that. One. Oh, wow. So uh, that's especially for you. Uh, okay, let's jump. I guess uh, 70s, 80s era, West Texas State University. Twelve yes. wrestlers came out of the university. How many can you remember just right off? I could probably do this pretty good. I may get, I may get almost all of them. Okay. Okay, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, mm-hmm. uh, Dusty Rhodes, although technically, okay, Terry Funk, Dory Funk. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bobby Duncombe, Tully Blanchard, Ted DiBiase, Manny Fernandez, Kelly Kaniski. Uh, did you see Tito Santana? Uh, you just did. That's 11. Which uh, is rather depressing. Okay, so I'm missing one. Oh, God. Uh, let me think. Billy Gunn! <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't... Actually, I don't know which one you skipped. That is 11. Uh, and these are from the book, by the way. Anyone like Okay, okay, wait, 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 okay, let's see. Dory Funk, Terry Funk. Okay. Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen. Bobby Duncan. Uh, you're not including John Ayers, because I don't think he ever wrestled. No. I think he just refereed. Um, Tully, Manny, Fernandez, Kelly Kinski, Ted DiBiase. Uh, man. Dusty Rhodes. Uh, okay, I don't know. Okay, Barry Wyndham. Wow, man, yeah, I knew that one. I just yeah. didn't come and up with it. And actually, two it's... honorable mentions, really. Uh, Dick Murdoch, he didn't really go, but told everybody he, didn't, he did. He didn't go. That was yeah. a myth. <laughs> right, yeah, but he told <laughs> everybody he did. He did. Do you, do you, so, he did. He did. He did. He did. Do you know the story about Dick Murdoch in the alumni game? Oh, yeah, yeah. I actually read that in your newsletter. I had no idea. Uh, Brian, do you know the story? I don't think I do. Okay, Dick Murdoch never played football at West Texas State, but always said that he did. So anyway, one year, he showed up and played in the alumni game and, like, like killed everybody. <laughs> and he never even played. He was never even a football player, and he just killed, like, all the guys on the varsity. And he showed up at the alumni game and, like, oh, my God, everybody thought he was, like, some superstar, you know, that played in the NFL that came down there, and he never even played college. But isn't that amazing? A great wrestling well, story. people from that one college... And actually, uh, you know, well, it's, it's, not, it's not because because it was 
Amarillo, and they had the tradition, and you know, right. the Bunks kids went there, and Scott Casey the, the, may have went there too. Uh, I think Scott Casey did go there um, as According to back. Terry Funk, he couldn't prove that he did, but he thinks he did. So I don't know. Let's ask. Scott Casey claimed he did. Okay. Or, so did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, by the way, something in your book, just just so you know. Sure. Um, as, as it pertains to the Olympics, I'm relatively positive the, that the Iron Sheik was never wrestled in the Olympics, mm-hmm. and I'm also positive that Klaus Wallace did do judo in the Olympics. We had bad news on the show. And Bad News actually uh, fought Klaus Wallace in the 76 Olympics in judo and beat him. So he was definitely in the 76 Olympics. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. That'd be something to put in the newsletter. Which we do keep the book updated in the newsletter. Uh, for those who don't know, we do a newsletter also. And it's basically built around the book where we keep everything updated. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's records and, and yeah. things like that of yeah. uh, all the titles. And you haven't, a- a- you haven't asked me about Abraham Lincoln yet either, by the way. Uh, no, I haven't. But uh, Abraham Lincoln definitely wrestled. You did a he did a great historical piece on on Abraham Lincoln as a wrestler. That was awesome, by the way. I appreciate that. Uh, that I, that was my favorite issue to put together ever. I mean, you yeah, talked about he, having an issue on wrestling before 1900, right? Right. Yeah. Every, everything that was, was pretty really interesting. And yeah. there's so little written about that. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff out there on like Frank Gotch in that era, and but prior to 1900, there's really very little out there to, to get a hold of. And there were some pretty important people back then, William Muldoon and yeah. uh, Colonel James H. McLaughlin, a guy who never has got the credit uh, as far as being as important as he was and nobody knowing who he is. Uh, a lot of people know Muldoon because, of course, he was a president of the New York State Athletic Commission for years, but most everybody has never heard of James H. McLaughlin, and he was as important a star, maybe not as important in the long term because Muldoon did a lot of other things, but in the ring, uh, McLaughlin was probably Muldoon's equal, in my opinion. Of course, there's no tapes. Go back and verify that, but if you go by <laughs> what all what what there is out there, he certainly... Uh, wrestling history, be. Someone who was it that told me? I think it was Gary Will, says, wrestling history is a minefield. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, he was... Uh, uh, Gary Will and Royal Duncan were both... Uh, very instrumental in that issue being put together, and also uh, the uh, Mike Chapman uh, was also mm-hmm. very, very mm-hmm. instrumental in putting that issue together. But uh, a lot, a lot of work went into that, and uh, I actually set out to disprove the Abraham Lincoln myth. I thought this was some. I didn't think you ever wrestled. I thought it was like some Abner Doubleday story. Oh, I thought that. Yeah. I thought I, I assumed it was some garbage come up with back in the 20s to kind of legitimize about the time wrestling was going from uh, a lot of real shoots to being worked I thought that was something they had come up with just to legitimize it say hey we had the famous president that was a wrestler so I thought it was a load of crap but the more I dug into it the more evidence come up and I actually uncovered several newspapers from that era that listed him as competing so do you think Spielberg's going to like show his matches in that movie? <laughs> uh, if he can dig up the film, I'd like to see it. <laughs> I'd like to see. I'd like to see him put that that part. We got a couple of questions here for you. Um, let me get that the, the historical. Um, so much stuff I want to talk to you about here too. Um, from from the book, but uh, anyway, this is um, someone says I have a question regarding the greatest tag team in the history of pro wrestling. I'm working on a 128-team tournament. Oh, good Lord. My question is, who should get the four number one seeds? My feeling is that two of them should be the Road Warriors and the British Bulldogs. So basically, you're trying to pick... You know, my favorite tag team of all time that I saw was uh, Bruiser Brody and Stan Hansen. And a lot of people would say... um, I mean, I would say... Road Warriors were very, very successful everywhere they went during their heyday. The Bulldogs were an excellent team, really excellent for their era, but they were not main eventers pretty much anywhere outside of Calgary. Okay. Uh, but they were they were innovators. Uh, I, have, what? I mean, uh, if you're looking at success long term, you know, I think, you know, Stevens and Patterson and Stevens and Bockwinkel are certainly two of the more famous teams. Bruiser and Crusher and the Andersons. Um, but I don't think, I mean, in the ring. Okay, here is the top ten list of the teams who held a major world tag team championship the longest period of time. Okay. okay. This is, across the board, top ten. Number ten, Steve Williams and Terry Gordy. Uh, they were excellent team. Do what? 
They were an excellent Oh, team. yeah. Oh, absolutely. One of my favorites. They held uh, the world belts in all Japan, the NWA, and WCW. Number nine was Demolition, believe it or not, made the top ten WWF tag team champions. Number eight, Larry Henning and Harley Race. Yeah, uh, WWE for years. Right. Yeah. Number seven, the Road Warriors. They held the world tag team titles four times in AWA, NWA, WWF combined. Uh, the Steiners at number six, and they're the most prolific tag team champion. They've held 11 world tag team titles spread across uh, IWGP, NWA, WCW, and WWF. Number <laughs> five is the Japanese team of uh, Kawada and, and Taue. Akira Taue. Right. And all six of theirs came in all Japan. Gene and Ole Anderson are number four in the NWA. Uh, number three, the top three are all AWA teams. Number three, and this one surprised me because I'd never really thought about them as... The High Flyers. You know, yeah, the High Flyers. I right. got it. All right. Yeah. Uh, Bob Winkle and Stevens are at number two. And number one are Crusher and the Bruiser at 1,330 days spread across five reigns in the AWA. Uh, good 130-something more days than Bob Winkle and Stevens. So... Now, they're top. There's, there, there's, there's a couple of teams. You know, when we started talking about that, I think like another, some other teams that I think of as the best ones I've ever saw were um, Misawa and Kobashi. Um, were aw- now, you know, they were an awesome team when they were together. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 the world thing is it's kind of weird because oh, God, someday I'd like to think about, like, what should constitute a real-world title. And a, oh, absolutely. And a, absolutely. You know, that's a title. Right, it's, that's it's something like, I grappled with hard. I mean, you know, yeah, who, because, who because, 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 like, to me, it's like, I there's no such thing as, except for WWF right now, right. there's really no such thing as a worldwide, and I guess NWA, World Heavyweight, right. was a real worldwide championship because they went to Japan and New Zealand and everywhere. But those are really the only ones where the, they, the guys actually traveled right. everywhere and were recognized everywhere as main event world champions because... AWA was still more. I mean, it was it was a huge regional, a oh, very well respected regional, but still a regional. WWF was a regional until they went national. Correct. On um, the list I've compiled and kept together, the criteria I used were basically. I mean, there's really no hard criteria. I basically just took every every group that you know, is generally considered to be quote a world title, and nowadays because they don't travel the world very often, not like the NWA did. you got to go by company size and prominence and things like that, but I, you know, I think it would be hard to argue with the ones I, I have in there. And I do then have an argument. Add, yeah, I have drawing power. Right, exactly. I've added a minor world title section to this book because there was such, you know, uh, whether certain ones should be in there. I've, I've added uh, WWA out of California, uh, the USWA United, I mean, uh, yeah, Unified United. title, uh, the world class title after they split with NWA and, and some of those groups, the universal title and, and such. I've actually put a whole chapter in there of what I deemed minor world titles, of course, you know, who, who can say really? Well, you know, the thing is, okay, where, where I would look at it is if, if a group is the dominant group in an entire country, and, and, and like when the country's like really over, you know, and it's like, it's like, you know, like, uh, I mean, the EMLL lighter weight titles to me have more significance. I would say the heavyweight, though, and they've never had, they right. never really had a world heavyweight that's, that's except right, yeah. the, 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 the CMLL world heavyweight, they never really took seriously, but the old, certainly the old NWA titles when Santo and those guys had it, middleweight, welterweight, and, and light heavyweight were, you know, probably far more significant than anything except for the a few major titles. I think that some of the belts, like you know, that Ricky Dozan held and Baba held, Great. and Enoki held. You know, Enoki's NWF. You know, even though they weren't called World, although Enoki's NWF was called World before the IWGP. You know, that was a pretty big deal. And then also uh, Barnett, Jim Barnett's Australian guys. I mean, that was you know that IWA World Title was you know World Title for Australia, and it was like you know right. it was a, a major national promotion. It was a big deal. The one that I always question is uh, ECW. Um, to me, and you know, and I'm they travel. I just yeah, I, I used it. I considered it to be on the same level as the big ones, just because most modern fans that's what they know. And uh, I didn't want the book to seem all history where people yeah. nowadays couldn't enjoy it. So ECW, I, you know, really has. Yeah, I know. To I know you put it. In, I, I don't. I don't see where an ECW title is anywhere near as significant as. 
you know, in All Japan or in New Japan when you've got a national promotion on network television or even even a Mid-South or one of the top regionals, um, you know, a good regional title in the territory because, I mean, you're talking about some of those territories through real money. ECW never never really did. And, um, you know, Mid-South, when they had national syndication, I mean, their right. viewership was tons bigger than ECW's ever was. Right. So, yeah, the UWF belt also I included in the minor section. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, I mean to me, the UWF was a much, well, I mean, they were a much bigger promotion, um, you know, certainly in their history, you know, going back to Mid-South than ECW ever was. I mean, that was, was, so was in the major section or the minor section? Major. Okay. You, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's just my Also, opinion. Inoki, talking about him, the uh, major belts I, I took into account on him with IG, IWGP and the WWF, but he had a brief reign there in, what, 79, and he came in at number 20 on the list, but uh, some of those IWGP things were when they were doing the annual tournament, so it's kind of misleading, too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he also did the NWF thing for right, you know, like exactly, seven yeah. years, and, and, I mean, in Japan, you know, that was like, you know, I mean, you're on network TV, and, you know, he was the god exactly of, I mean, right, yeah. you know, I mean, except for, except for nobody. I was going to say Hogan, and that's not true. I mean, there's nobody that was bigger than Anoki. Oh, you know, when, you know, when he, and he was fighting Ali and Willem Ruska and all those people, you know. Even though he didn't get the top Americans, because Baba had all the top Americans of that era, you know, work for him or most of them. Right. But anyway, that's uh, from Fred Heisen, who says, WF.com has a poll on their website asking fans to name the new WCW television show on CNN. Here are the names uh, that they have on their poll. WCW Saturday Nitro, which is probably the number one contender. WCW Hot Fox. WCW Uprising. WCW Late Night Appetite. WCW Hard On. Seriously. No way. No yes, way. I'm not making this up. And WCW Primal Urge. So those are names. Horrible. Yeah, I know all those stuff. Except not. Well, it's Nitro's. Nitro's a traditional one. Probably win. Um, there's a few questions here for uh, Carl from Dancer okay. Patel in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, he goes, what was the most significant event in the genesis of pro wrestling before 1900? Before 1900, uh, it would have to be something involving William Muldoon, without doubt. Probably his, uh, uh, no, I, I, I'll tell you exactly what it was. Richard K. Fox launching uh, National Police Gazette, without question. Okay. Uh, uh, what, do, what does the success of Frank Gotch owe to Farmer Burns, taking him under his wing? Probably all of the success. Uh, yeah, a, a great deal. Well, I, I don't know. Fox was... Uh, Pretty instrumental in getting his name out there, too. I mean, Richard K. Fox was, I mean, he was a major power player back in uh, circa 1900. He pushed Muldoon hard and also Gotch. In fact, he published a book for Gotch on uh, his uh, wrestling. And I've got a photo of that book in the latest newsletter uh, and, and some information about it. Uh, he was, I mean, he he wasn't a promoter, but gosh, he was, he was definitely to wrestling in 1900 what I guess the after mags were in the early 80s and I guess what the Observer is today. I mean, they has you, how else are you going to know about these guys if somebody's not, you know, putting it out there? And that's free TV, so uh, people read back then. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> he was a power player. Yeah. Uh, this is one. What is your opinion? That's just what my opinion is as well. On the 1911 Hotch, Hot, gosh, Gotch Hackenschmidt knee injury. Mike Chapman says it's it was all made up by Hackenschmidt later on. There was no such hooking incident involving. I, 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 don't, I, I, I can tell you why. I, I can tell you why I don't buy that one, and, and I got a really good reason for that. And that is that um, Hackenschmidt was a famous weightlifter. And Hackenschmidt was, I mean, and that was his passion. He was the number one weightlifter in the world. And Hackenschmidt could never lift heavy weights after that match. And, wow. you know, so to me that's a pretty good indication that he got his knee blown out. Now, now whether it was Ad Santel or Ben Roller or whatever it was, um, Ruth that, Ferris, you know. I mean, Lou Ferris swears by that story. I mean, he's... The Ad Santel story. Yeah, and everyone used to say that there's no way it was true. And then all of a sudden they've uncovered that Ad Santel was definitely around then. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Because originally oh. everyone thought that Ad Santel wasn't even around in those days. No, no I, I, I dispute that myself. I, you know, but Ruth says, I mean, he wouldn't have got the story firsthand, but he sure would have got it secondhand. Uh, no, Ruth sure got it firsthand. Ruth was trained but... by Ad Santel. Oh, really? 
Luthes uh, was trained by Ad Santel. Ad Santel's the one who told him the story. Yeah, okay, yeah. Santel was, uh, was still. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I, well, I guess if anybody would know, he would. I mean, because yeah. he's like the last connection to that whole era, and yeah. I don't see why he would gain by making anything up about it. Yeah, but he, he yeah. will... He uh, will push his train. He will push his trainers as legends, though. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know. I, I mean, I've read Hooker, so <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, so I mean, that's that. That, that is what the thing. You know, he, he was going to get Lewis Obers. Uh, Although you know, there's people. He, you know, he's been on the show and stuff and talked about guys who could have beaten Lewis. You know, he said uh, yeah. Jim Browning, and um, I think that was the only one he actually said. He said, he said Stecker may have been better than Lewis actually. So, well, you know. Okay, here's a quick little piece of trivia from that same era. This is also from the book. Who are the only three wrestlers to defeat Frank Gotch between 1905 and 1913? Got any idea? Oh, I'll know him pretty quick. Uh, let's see. There's Fred only Beal. Fred Beal, that's correct. Tom Jenkins. Correct, 1905. And I don't know the third. Number three was Stan East Lisa Bisco in 1909. That's the only but that three. was sort of a handicap match thing. Yeah, uh, yeah correct. It was uh, based on falls and stuff. He had several draws where, you know, it was handicap rules, but those are the only three... Uh, to you know, get a decisive victory. They, they, they did a handicap match to build up a world, a later world title match with Stanislaus Zabisco, right. and and every match in those days was not a work, right? Oh no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you look back at the way they did programs and and, and the newspaper sto- I mean, there were newspaper stories that are so skeptical, and you know, it's like so, you know. Oh and, yeah, and I'm yeah. sure. I, I mean, and I, I do believe that both Gotch Hackett's great matches were real, but I mean, I've looked at newspaper stories from like 1909 and stuff. And they basically say, you know, 98% of the pro wrestling matches now are, are worked, you know, but some of them are still shoots. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, so even pre-1900, some of the, uh, I was talking about McLaughlin earlier, James McLaughlin, some of his, some of the newspaper articles about his uh, matches around the 18, late 1880s or, and even earlier uh, specifically stated in there that, there was no question as to the legitimacy of this match, and that clearly indicates that there must that have there been question yeah, there was questions about some of them. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, even before 1900, there was you know a lot of it. I'm sure from the beginning of time there has been. This, Almost this, on par with boxing today. So yeah, this is from Garen Shea, who goes. I was wondering exactly when the WWF purchased Georgia Championship Wrestling in 1984. You mentioned there was a court fight going up until the day the deal was done. The TV shows prior to Black Saturday, July 14th, gave no indication that was going on. Um, I know that, um, I mean, I had in the Observer back then, like at least a couple of months before that this was going down. So I would say probably a good two months before it happened, um, if the purchase actually took place. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, I mean, I don't remember these exact details. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, with with his multiple city title victories. That's right, because Lawler won his titles in Memphis, Louisville, Nashville, and Evansville. Because Lawler's got to have won at least 400 belts. <laughs> oh, he has. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm so looking forward to the new blood angle in WOW. <laughs> oh my God! Imagine that. Oh. You have to bring in some old people though to make it work. May Young. Yeah, R- Russo's Lula. ratings are going to outrate the Chicken Grill infomercials for at least the first seven minutes of the Terry Gold Slam Dunk KFC Chicken on a Pole match. <laughs> oh, I, I can't oh, wait on. for the shoot angles and wow. Oh please, please guys! You, I, I heard you guys say yesterday or the day before there was going to be no more Russo talk till he done something. Well, we get emails. What can I, mean, I say? Come on! Oh, he's so horrible. Uh, let's see. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Did Larry Lane go to West Texas State? That's an interesting one. He was a college wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he wasn't a football player, and he may have. I don't know. The majority of the information on that particular one came from uh, Terry Funk. Uh, yeah, Terry Funk. So, uh, and I think he compiled it from some yearbooks, and he didn't make mention of it. But again, you know, he, he could have. You know, accidentally left somebody off. I wouldn't. I don't know. I, I don't know. This is. From, I personally think WF has to upset its salary structure and get Goldberg. Okay. Um. Let's see. Do you ever see China getting the Intercontinental Title back? No. No. Um. Do you think that in order to get Paul Heyman to join the WS Creative team, that Heyman demanded the color job on Raw, so Lawler became the sacrificial lamb? No. I don't think he wanted that job. No. Um, has Steve Austin ever refused to do a job or put over other WF talents? Yeah, well, he definitely refused to do a job for Rock when uh, he was supposed to drop the Intercontinental title. That's I, think, why I think I was thinking back. I think Austin is the guy that threw the belts off the uh, bridge. 
Because that was right. like... He threw the belt off to Bruce job. rather than... Right. right. Yeah, okay. And then he, then he had the problem with Jeff Jarrett, too, didn't he? Yeah. Um, I don't think it was so much... Yeah, well, he refused to work with him. That was never... I don't think they ever asked him to do a job for him. They never even got close to that part. That far. Uh, how old is Bill Goldberg? Uh, Bill Goldberg would be 34. Why is he so highly regarded? Uh, because in 1998, he was over like crazy, and people remember that, and, and they still chant his name. Uh, he goes, I see him as a white Ahmed Johnson. Oh, oh no, come on. No, I don't think so yeah. either. Both had great intensity in the ring. Both were pushed like monsters, and both were exposing their mic work and heel turns. Uh, they both and one drew money. Yeah. And yeah, Ahmed never... Uh, and yeah, Ahmed never could could work some. I mean, even though he was young yeah, and I mean, was so yeah. clumsy. And Gold- Goldberg was is dangerous, but it's a different way. Both, not that it's better. Both Ahmed and Goldberg injured themselves and others in the ring. I see a lot of comparisons between the two. Will Shawn Michaels be sent to the WCW division? I seriously doubt it. Ser- um, let's see. Uh, let me see. If I mean, when I watch like Goldberg and when I watch Ahmed Johnson, I was afraid that Goldberg was going to kill somebody else. I was afraid Ahmed would kill himself and his opponent. If Goldberg he would do like those crazy dives over the top rope and landed his head on the floor, and I thought this guy ain't gonna make it. If Goldberg had had somebody really good to, to train with, he could have turned out to be. I mean, there was definitely potential there. Oh, yeah. awesome potential! He like he been Flair every night on the road, and Bret Hart, except he, yep. you know. But at that point, WCW didn't care. I mean, they had a, they had a big name, big pop, and were going with it. So, yeah, who cares if he could actually? Uh, let's see. What's super crazy status? Why aren't AAA or email using him on television? Well, it's because he's in Puerto Rico right now. Is Paul trying to, going to try to get him into WCW? Um, it's not up to... I mean, they, they may. I wouldn't be surprised to see him. In, you know, it's just kind of up in the air as far as him. You know, the problem is, is that there are people in WWF that have a mind block when it comes to Mexican talent, and he's Mexican talent. Uh, let's see. I hope he does, though. Um... This is okay. This is some of those. In the interest of fairness and maintaining integrity, I think you should clarify your statements concerning Vince Russo's statement on his website. He never said the botched bikini segment beat the return of Austin on Raw. Just the segment popped a higher rating than any other segment that night. Uh, okay, that may that may be yeah, that may be true. I'll have to look that one up. His point is that women can draw ratings in the male-dominated field of pro wrestling. That's true. I mean, Sable drew huge ratings. Uh, that W. Oh, w- w- said that that segment beat the return of Austin. I, I, I have it. Uh, okay. I have it here. I'll check it out after the show. Okay. Uh, he stated that Sable was the second most over person in the WF during her stay, and that garnered a lot of jealous feelings. You know, there's a question of what over means, but Sable at one point was the biggest ratings draw in the WWF, and that's for sure, for about a six-month period. And Sable was a big, big star there and a big merchandise seller. I don't think Sable was the second biggest pay-per-view or ticket seller at any point, though, and that's really the determination of over. But but you know and she was a, but she did draw ratings, uh, leading to an unfortunate situation. I can only I only bring this to your attention because I assume you want to be objective in your commentary, and you strike me as an honest guy in an industry that truly lacks integrity. Russo may be a buffoon, but not everything that comes out of his mouth is crap. Now that's true. Not everything that comes out of his mouth is crap. Um, but <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh. Sal is a fool. Akiyama's the future of the company, and what does he do? Waste him. Hey, I want to tell you something about that. They have a show on Sunday, Easter Sunday, at the Ariake Coliseum. They need to sell tickets for it. And Misawa versus Vader sells more tickets than Akiyama versus Vader. That was the right decision. I mean, I, I knew that when that result came in, that people would go, you know, he, he didn't put the young guy over and all this. Everything in the right situation at the right time. In this situation, Misawa had to win. It would have been a dumb booking decision for Misawa to lose because it would cost him money on the big show, and that's what they're building for Sunday's big show. Uh, this Okay, one more thing. This is, how would Dory Funk Jr. versus Jack Briscoe compare with Flair and Steamboat in terms of match quality? It seems like these two are always called the greatest feuds ever. And I was wondering which you thought was better and why. Uh, that is so tough because you're talking about different eras. If you watch tapes of both today, Flair and Steamboat would be much better because yeah. it's more modern. Absolutely. But Funk and Briscoe was the standard great wrestling match of the early 70s, and Flair and Steamboat was the standard great wrestling match of, you know, the... I guess the late 70s and throughout the 80s. Um, I think that Briscoe and Funk was bigger in more parts of the country during the regional days of wrestling. Because um, that, that, you know, that, that spread across every territory almost and, and drew everywhere. Um, and was the number one world title program. But, you know, Flair and Steamboat, as far as drawing money for more years on and off, you know, they started that feud probably around 76 and they were still doing it in like 94. 
I mean, Funk and Briscoe feuded for a long time, but the real big money singles feud was probably 1970 to maybe 75. So, I don't know, Carl, what's your thoughts on, on comparing Flair and Steamboat with uh, Funk and Briscoe? Well, I was a big fan of the uh, Flair Steamboat era. I mean, that was, wow, that was great. And it really is comparing apples and oranges, truthfully, because it, the styles were so different. I saw some of the uh, Dory Funk Jr. Briscoe mat, uh, matches, and, I, you know, for the time, they were they were something. But if you were to sit down today and watch them on tape, you'd definitely want Flair Steamboat. I mean, nah, I, that's, I, no, I, that's no disrespect to those guys either. I mean, that for the day, that was something else. And the programs meant something and were very interesting. But as far as match quality goes compared to what you see today, Flair and Steamboat would stand strong with anything. Yeah, I mean, one thing, like, you know, people will talk about, like, classic guys from the 50s, but just because of the style of wrestling, if you ever watch 50s tapes, I mean, they're not going to be right. as good as these matches today because the style didn't evolve. I mean, generally speaking, with exceptions, you know, like, say, Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid who were ahead of their time, but, but generally speaking, the more modern the match, uh, the better the match. You know, by today, if you're, you know, there's more, more action and things like that, but, you know, like, you know, they were both... They were the classic feuds of the time. I mean, to me, probably Miss Alec Wada was better than Flair Steamboat or Funk Briscoe, you know, which was like the classic feud of, say, the mid-90s. You know, but, you know, again, it's the style had advanced. Okay, we've got uh, raw ratings. It got a 5.4, so it was down a little bit from last week. The main event uh, with the Hardys and Lita against Stone Cold, Triple H, and Stephanie did a 6.0, which was the second highest rated segment, the Vince and Linda interview, did a 6.2, oh. and uh, where did that recap? The recap did a 5.1, uh, the 15-minute recap of the thing from the week before, which actually, mm-hmm. I don't know, I mean, it's what it was. I don't, it doesn't really say anything one way or the other. They really dropped down to a 5.3 for Val Venus and Raven. Sucks to be them. Uh, let's see. we got some more names, because I can't believe the names that WF has put on their poll. Uh, except for the original Nitro name, every one is awful. I've got some better ones for you. Uh, WCW Tradition is Dead, WCW Saturday Night Monopoly, WCW Pissed <laughs> Off, yeah, <okay. laughs> WCW Sa- Saturday Nitro Live, oh, that's a good one, WCW Buyout, and uh, another one. WCW Orton is Nitro, I don't get that one. Oh, that's Nitro, oh, that's Orton is Nitro backwards. I still don't get it, but I know what it means. Uh, anyway. Raw is War. Oh, Raw is War, Orton is Nitro. Oh, Brian, you're so clever. That's pretty clever. That is clever, yeah. Uh, what's it? What's the new WCW going to be like if none of the top stars get a buyout from Time Warner? Well, we'll find out. Uh, let's see. Um, get through a few things real quick. Uh, let's see. When Bachwinkle was making dates for All Japan, Crockett, Houston, Germany, Georgia, Toronto, the AWA is definitely a world title. Yeah, Bachwin- When Bachwinkle was champion, I would. I have to agree. He went everywhere. Um, let's see. Is there any footage of Santo wrestling um, besides in the movies? That's a good question. Is there any footage? I'm sure that they have them because e- EML probably has it, but um, I don't. I never. I don't know. Except in the movies. <laughs> so I've seen all the movie footage have, of them. Yeah. Uh, as far as the ECW World Title, you must re- remember it was defended in Japan and Canada, so technically it was defended around the world. It was defended in Canada like what twice? Japan. Um, I was defend- I, on FMW shows, but it wasn't even main event there. But um, I think actually maybe it was once. It was defended a few times in Japan. Uh, why did WCW break up the Hollywood Blondes in 1993? They were so over, and you should add them to the list of the greatest tag teams. It was one of those many things that WCW did that, in hindsight, make no sense. It made no sense at the time, either. It, you know what happened is they... they I'll, I'll tell you what happened with that one, okay? Because uh, there was a clash of the champions, and it was um, it was uh, the Hollywood Blondes against Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. And it's a 2.6 rating, which was an, a horrible rating at that time. It was Ric Flair's first match back in WCW, and, and why he did that rating, I don't know. You know, probably was a, a Jewish holiday that night, too. But um, it did, and so afterwards they had a big meeting, and they decided that it was Flair and Pillman, I mean, it was Pillman and Austin's fault, and they had to break up as a team because they weren't over. Even though they were, like, the only thing in the company that was over, it was their fault. And uh, they just told them. Greg Gagne went to Brian Pillman and Steve Austin and said, you guys just aren't over. And that's <laughs> probably why they love Greg Gagne to this day. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know what else do we have. Does Roddy Piper have a future in WCW? No. Uh, it'd be nope. great, great to see Roddy Piper feud Mick, with Mick Foley or Triple H. <laughs> no one. Jeez. Uh, was Pride? No, it could be worse. 
Was Pride really disappointed with their rating? They shouldn't have been. I don't know because I haven't talked to anyone from the organization. It's from Mike who says, the attendance for the last uh, New York, New Jersey Hitman game was 29,199. That was from the stadium office. I mean, that may be the number that was in the building, but we don't know what paid versus paper is because they pay for a lot in New York. Um, merchandise sales were actually pretty good for a startup league. The XFL said it would lose money for the first two years, which it will. They also said they would make money in the third year, which they won't. Uh, XFL average attendance really wasn't 23,000. It was closer to 15. That's about right because I heard that the numbers they generally mentioned were 40% higher than usual. Those attendance figures are legit um, and better than WCW or ECW. Yeah, they're way better. Oh, they God. better do better than WCW so or ECW. What? They don't exist. They don't exist either. Um, <laughs> Plus, with uh, you know, football's got to outdraw wrestling because you're doing stadium and you're only doing five home games. Wrestling's doing, you know, should do like 150, 200 dates a year. You know, they're not going to average as much doing that many dates. Let's get to the phone calls. We're going to start with Terry. We got to make everyone quick, okay? Okay. Yes, um, David. Uh, was this a man responsible for um, destroying the a- um, AWA? Um, I mean, I would, you know, I mean, he put the nail. You know, him and Vern Gagne both. You know, from within and with, from without. Yeah, they were the two that killed it. Uh, what are you also responsible for um, USWA and um, Smoky Mountain too? Vince responsible for them? Mm-hmm. Um, no. I mean, yes, in, in, in effect that Vince got so strong that they couldn't compete with him. Yes. No. I mean, he didn't directly do anything to kill him. The economics of the time, well, the economic, well, USWA actually went down because, you know, well, the economics of the time killed USWA, and then they did that, that big buyout swerve thing, which killed it. Smoky Mountain was the economics that cost too much to uh, buy television time, and they couldn't make it up at the gate, so they couldn't make any money. And um, that's what killed it. But, you know, the fact that WWF was the major league in all these markets, and they couldn't compete with it, was one of the reasons. It's not Vince's fault, but, you know, it was a reason that, a lot, that most of these companies went under. Oh, okay. And also, too, it seemed like Vince... I mean, it's like he he shouldn't be blamed... He shouldn't be blamed for it, but, you know, it is the reason. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to blame him for, for, you know, producing great, you know, production of of wrestling television. That's that's what he should do. You know what I mean? You can't say, oh, his wrestling, you know, his production was so good, he killed everybody, and it's unfair. It's like, it's just the survival of the fittest. Hmm. Also, too, um... I want to know this right here. Um, if there's Russo and McMahon um, exclusive for each other, because it seems like that um, some of Russo's style of booking is uh, taking place in the WWF now, such as... Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's not a compliment, you know. <laughs> That's what it seems like now. Yeah, they... Uh, uh, put it this way. If they were in cahoots and there was evidence of that, I said Turner would own WWF very soon, so I would think that, uh, you know, so I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's one of the other strategies to try and destroy an organization. Yeah. Because I'm um, already, Matt Hardy's already the Intercontinental Champion just Jeff. after. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff yeah. Jeff Intercontinental. Jeff won. Yeah, this seems like something Russo would have done. It seems like they're slipping on the book in a little bit since they ain't got no competition. No, that's not the wrong thing he would have done. I mean, I'm not saying a young Russo guy trying to put a young guy over. It's not like they were putting over. Uh, God, they need China. to put some young ba- They need to put a young baby face over in the worst way. Hmm. So, yeah. That was the guy they picked. You know, there's people who think he's going to be the new Shawn Michaels. And, you know, I mean, hey, he's a talented guy. I don't know that he will be. He's been that for a long time, though. It's a, tough man to li- it's a tough man to live up to. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's a hardworking guy. He's, you know, people love him. So, what the hell? Give him a chance. I, I mean, if it works out, cool. And if it doesn't work out, nothing ventured, nothing gained. They could have started yeah. out with a European title or a uh, lightweight belt. Yeah, but well, they killed the lightweight belt, thing. and the European belt would be a waste of his time and everyone's time. So, it's probably... You know, it, 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 I mean, I think it probably will make for good TV tomorrow. Okay, right. Terry, we got to get running because we got to get a lot of calls in, okay? All right, Sean, Sean, what's going on? Man, I don't know how you put up with some of these callers, man. Like, <laughs> you, got, you guys need a medal. People asking about Blockbuster, asking if he yacht is on the, you know, it's just, you know, I, I don't know how you guys deal with it. But, um, Mr. Stein, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, why do they call an, an Irish whip an Irish whip? Uh, give up one. Oh, no, I, I, I think that maybe the first guy to do it probably was an Irish guy. Well, uh, and that's I'm just a guess. Just like yeah. a German suplex? I really don't know. I really don't well, know. Well, you know what's funny is the German suplex, the, the guy who made it famous was uh, a Belgium guy. <laughs> <laughs> who Belgium invented it? I don't know who invented it, but Carl Gotch was the one who popularized it, and they called it German suplex, but he was from Belgium, so I don't know. Yeah, I really don't. Uh, I really don't. Maybe they thought they were the same place. <laughs> you know what's funny is is um, 
you, you know something that's funny is like uh, in the 80s and 90s, there's the, you know the, the, the move, I don't know if you, I've never seen you actually do it, Brian, but you know the underhook arm drag? It's not like an arm drag. Ricky Morton used to do it all the time, so Carl, you'd remember that. Mm-hmm. You know, and they used to call it the Mexican arm drag, and I swear I watched Mexican wrestling for 20 <laughs> years and I never saw that move once. <laughs> but it was always called Mexican arm drag. It's like Australian tag rules that started in San Francisco, yeah. Is that where they started? I think so. I, who knows? You know. I mean, the Fuller's always so claimed it was their grandfather or great grandfather that started it, and so that probably was not Australia. But the Australians also claimed that they started it too. So who knows? I thought yeah. it was just a gimmick for well, the. Well, they got to claim something. <laughs> yeah, I, I just always wondered, and I tell you, you know, since you had this story and on, I, you know, I thought you know, I, I do have one more comment. You know, if, if WCW actually does rename their TV Hard On, it might be the first time in a couple of years somebody actually has a Hard On for WCW programming. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's got it, guys. Thanks a lot. Dude, that Those dude had are... to have made up that name. No, that's no, it's on the website. It's where? Website. Hey, that was it funny. is on the website. No way. That's impossible. Well, that's got to just be a joke. No, it's WCW Hard On Saturday Night. Absolutely. It's right here. <laughs> hey, I'm voting for it, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. Who's up now? Are we on Franco? Okay, we got Jason in Wisconsin. Jason, what's going on? Oh, not much, guys. Love the newsletters. Carl, I love your books. Thank you. Uh, I can't believe you guys are going to make me follow the killer dick joke like that. <laughs> but uh, I guess the question I had for you, was there ever anything that occurred in all your years of watching wrestling that actually drew money that you were totally mystified by, that you couldn't believe it actually drew money? That drew uh, money? Me? Yeah. The Ultimate Warrior and Andre the Giant feud. <laughs> a string of 30-second main events, sure. That'll draw no, a ton. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I mean, I thought after those, I mean, and I was at a show when mm-hmm. they did that, and the people went home and they were like, look at each other. I thought they killed the cities, but they came back to the cities and still drew. So I wouldn't say that that match drawing money didn't surprise me, but the fact they came back a month later and they didn't kill the cities, I was, very, I was surprised because I thought this is just like... What is? What are they thinking? And, and as it turned out, as it turned out, maybe they knew more than me. Maybe the the right thing to do with all with Andre the Giant was a, at that point in time was a thirty second. It probably was. Well, what did they come you know, back I mean, with? You couldn't do anything anymore. They didn't come back uh, with a rematch, did they? Yeah, they came back with rematches, and they did no DQs way. in like How seven could minutes. That be? And the Wasn't rematches that during were, the time where they were running almost triple shots on the weekends, oh, running like eight, so nine shows, shows a week. Man. Yeah, they did when they did the come. Now, now I saw one of the, the comebacks where they did the seven minute match. Now that was hideous. <laughs> People are probably oh, man. We should. Uh, Andre we should the Giant. Like three second match again. Yeah, Andre was in a, was basically almost wheelchair bound by then. He could barely stand up, and and Ultimate Warrior was obviously great at carrying matches. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. Anything, and, Carl, I did have one more here? comment um, about explaining why uh, Vince and Linda will ultimately get back together. It'll be the same explanation they give when Vince decides to hold up the XFL championship and then fold the league. He doesn't know what's an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for your show, guys. Bye. Okay, you're very welcome. Any, any other calls? We're going to go to emails. Okay, what is Jim Ross's age? God, I had that in the... Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm thinking about 50-ish. Uh, really? the Hall of Fame thing, I had his birthday, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, but, yeah, late 40s, maybe 50. Are... All of HBK's trainees in Memphis signed to WF developmental deals. Yes, they are. Is Shane McMahon's real name Shane Brandon or Andrew Shane McMahon? I don't know. Um, any chance of the Nitro girls in the WWF? Uh, well, Stacey Keebler, will probably, Stacey Keebler will be the only one. Uh, can you explain the recent direction of the Triple H character? He wins a 2 out of 3 fall match against his hated enemy. He loses Queen of the Undertaker. He aligns himself with his hated enemy. And then he wins Jericho's title and loses Jeff, Jeff Hardy. What's up? Uh, they book week to week. <laughs> That's what's up. Uh, let's see. Hey, Dave, I, I know we're running close on time. Don't forget, I want to get those Observer Newsletter what? things in, too. So. Uh, why don't you do that right now? Okay, yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, real quick, also, I want to throw my addresses out there for folks. Go write them down real quick. Best way to order if you've got a credit card, go to kfabemagazine.com. Click on the story about this show and go to my website and order it. If you got a pen and want to go straight to my website, it's www.angelfire.com slash AL slash Dragon King. That'll take you there. And also, you may can get there through the Pro Wrestling Connection. We were having some problems earlier, but I'll write for them too. But here we go. Five greatest issues ever of Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Number five, the Brian Pillman tribute uh, issue when he died. 
Uh, number four, Andre the Giant uh, obituary issue. Number three, Death of a Dynasty, Kerry Von Eric from 1993. Number two, the original Hall of Fame issue from 1996. And number one, in my opinion, the greatest issue observer ever was the Bruiser Brody obituary issue. A lot, a lot of people say, I, I, to me, um, I would say number three. Really? I, I don't when think I, so. When uh, I was done with that one, I thought that, that you know what the other one that I that I personally really liked was uh, at just after finishing writing it was uh, the one when JYD died. Yeah, that was uh, and that mm -hmm. was a really good one. Uh, the reason I put Brody at the top is because 1988 there was nowhere else to get that kind of insider information. I mean, you had to either get it out of the tabloids or the after mags, and uh, you know that was the only place at the time to get something truthful on it. So that's why I thought it was because uh, by the time Junkyard Dog died, there was a proliferation of different newsletters out there that, and while you may not could have got the exact same thing, you could have got at least the news. The Brody thing was, you know, that was the only place to go to get the whole real story. So that's why I, I tell you about, about that that issue, which is it's, which the, I, the the Bruiser Brody issue was really weird because you know, that's before. I had, you know, I guess before, you know, there was uh, computers and everything. So, so I, I typed that one, you know, on a typewriter, and I sat in front of the typewriter uh, from like seven o'clock at night to midnight, and did not even have a first sentence. I just sat in front of the typewriter, and then at midnight I came up with the lead, whatever it was, which I don't remember. And from midnight to four a.m. on a Saturday night, I did that issue with like no rewrite, no editing, no nothing. Wow. And and you know, and and you know, when I did it, I didn't know if it was going to be good or bad. And when I when I came back, I mean, most of the reaction, you know, ninety percent of the reaction was really, really good. And and at the time, you know, it was like the first, it was the first like issue that I did that I thought was like really, like really, really good. You know, because it, it was the first obituary. We never did one like that before. Yeah. But there were a lot of people who were just going like, "How could you devote seven pages of our issue, you know, to one story? Yeah. And you know, what about all the other news?" You know, like, I mean, there was, I mean, I was amazed at, at um, again, at 10% of criticism. Wow. You know, now, you know, if, like when somebody dies, if I, you know, like when Owen when Hart, when Owen Hart died, I mean, eh, there's nobody complained about that. Yeah. Hey, I do want to throw out real quick, the uh, people who order the book do get a free copy of, of the Dragon King Update Report newsletter. I don't know which issue you'll get, but you will definitely get one with the book, so good chance to check it out, too. Okay, we are just about out of time. I just want to read one more email. Got Sean Michaels from John who goes, Was Sean Michaels supposed to drop the title Sid the night he lost his smile? Yes. If so, then why? Because they were not booking smart that year. <laughs> what would have been his role in WrestleMania 13 and everything went as planned? Uh, he would have wrestled Bret Hart in the match that Steve Austin ended up in, and uh, he would have lost that match, which is why his knee didn't recover until about a month later. I can't see them choosing Sid over Sean for the WrestleMania title defense, and let me tell you something. Neither could I when that happened, and, and looking back four years, I am absolutely dumbfounded that anyone faced with the decision-making in February of 1997 of a long-awaited Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels rematch, which, um, or Undertaker and Sid as the WrestleMania main event, that they picked Undertaker and Sid, and they did 237,000 buys for that WrestleMania, which, is <laughs> by, which was horrible. For a WrestleMania, I mean, it was like WCW did like seven pay-per-views that outdid WrestleMania that year, including the one that, including the uncensored from that same month. And the reason is, is because they decided that the big guys are what draws money, and Brett and Sean were not. And it turned out it didn't really matter anyway because, you know, Sean Sean wasn't there anyway. <laughs> Sean wasn't there for the show anyway. So what does it matter? Maybe they maybe they made the right decision maybe they knew that Sean wasn't going to do the job for Brett and they were actually right and he was going to he was going to bail out on him and at least they had to get the belt off him as soon as possible and uh, maybe they figured they could get him to do it for Sid and he'd never do it for Brett and uh, he didn't do it for Sid anyway so what the hell anyway that's all the time that we have Carl I want to thank you very much for doing the show today yeah, oh, I enjoyed it greatly and uh, I'd love to talk to you some more about this stuff because I love talking about wrestling history sure man I'm open anytime so we'll do this again, and uh, we're going to have Shelton Benjamin from Ohio Valley Wrestling here tomorrow, so we'll see everybody at 5. E